Hello and welcome everyone to tonight's webinar, Endometriosis and Pelvic Pain Update, brought to you by Capital Health Network and obstetrician gynaecologist Dr Omar Adam from the Canberra Health Services. First, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are on. We acknowledge and respect their enduring culture and the contribution they make to the life of this region and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge and welcome other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending tonight's event. I am Dr. Leonie Harcourt, the GP advisor at Capital Health Network. And also with me tonight is Dr. Omar Adam and Kanal Mahoti from the Capital Health Network. Um, so on to housekeeping, all participants have been muted. Please put any questions, not in the chat box, please don't use the chat box, but in the Q&A section on your Zoom panel. And we're going to have the question and answer session at the end of the presentation tonight. We'll also um, upload the presentation to the Capital Health Network YouTube page, and you're welcome to share this with all your other networks. Um, Dr. Adams' last uh, webinar on prenatal screening has had 15,000 views, so obviously they're a really valuable and useful source, so we're happy for you to share them. Um, regarding CPD, uh, so if you fill out the post-evaluation survey that um, CHN will email to you, we can send you a certificate of attendance and please feel free to self-report one and a half hours of educational activities to your CPD home. So um, before we start, I just wanted to highlight a very useful resource, which is the um, ACT in Southern New South Wales Health Pathways website. The login is together and that's um, all lowercase, and the password is for health, all lowercase, F O R H E A L T H, one word. And just hoping that you use it, I personally find it very useful. Um, it's a great resource for clinical, up to date clinical and referral information that's localized mostly to the ACT in southern New South Wales area. If it's not localized, it has a message at the top saying it's not localized, but the clinical information is fabulous. And it's a collaboration between GPs and all the areas of the health system. So we also really value you, your feedback on the health pathways. And if you have a moment, um, you could fill in the feedback tab at the bottom of the health pathway. Okay, so um, on to Dr. Omar Adam. You may have met him before from our previous webinars um, and he's promised to do some more next year. So we thank him very much for that. Um, Dr. Adam is a skilled gynaecologist and he's working as a senior gynaecologist at the Canberra Hospital. His area of ex expertise is laparoscopic surgery and surgically complex endometriosis. So very relevant that he's talking about this tonight. And he also works in urogynecology. He's made significant contributions to clinical research and teaching. And he op also operates a private medical practice providing comprehensive obstetric and gynecological care to diverse patient populations. Okay, so over to you, Adam. I mean, Dr. Adam, sorry about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leonie, and welcome, everyone. I'm glad um, you can join us for tonight's lecture. Um, I thought I would present um, an overview of the current available guidelines um, that relates to endometriosis, and it includes um diagnosis and, and the current evidence and in, in the available treatment options. Um, there are three main guidelines we uh, refer to. So the um, European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology. This is um, a guideline that was most recently updated, sort of in 2022. It's a very comprehensive document. Um, and then uh, the NICE guidelines on endometriosis, which is a national institute for health and care excellence uh, in the UK. Uh, the last update was in 2017, and there is a current update in progress. Um, and lastly, we have the uh, Ranscott guideline for endometriosis, which is our um, the Royal Australian and New Zealand College. Um, and that was produced in 2021. Um, and I did, I've been involved in these guidelines and I uh, reviewed them most recently. Uh, the ASHA guidelines is the most up-to-date, uh, revised and reviewed uh, late last year. It's very comprehensive, as I mentioned. 
Uh, the NICE guideline is outdated and is currently under review. And the Ranscot guidelines that we have really um, drew from by the NICE guidelines. So it followed on from that. Uh, the key areas I'd like to um, talk about uh, tonight uh, would be about the clinical presentation of endometriosis, also an overview of our suggestions to the primary care assessment and specialist services, um, the diagnosis and the follow-up of patients with endometriosis, the available treatment options, the um, medical uh, and the surgical options, the alternatives to pharmacological and surgical treatments and the evidence behind those. Um, also wanted to touch base a little about the recurrence rates for endometriosis, any available prevention strategies and endometriosis in adolescence, um, the relationship between endometriosis or the impact of that on fertility. Um, and a very interesting topic to be to me is the pregnancy and endometriosis, the effect um, of uh, pregnancy on and the effect of endometriosis on pregnancy. Um, also, um, uh, I wanna talk briefly on endometriosis in postmenopausal women. So the signs and symptoms of endometriosis, um, endometriosis uh, should be suspected in women, uh, including those age 17 um, and under, who are presenting with um, one of the below symptoms. So persistent pelvic pain, uh, very painful periods affecting quality of life, uh, deep dyspareunia, um, pain on intercourse, uh, quite deep pain, um, period-related or cyclical uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, so um, cyclical um, uh, bloating, um, uh, painful bowel motions known as dyskesia and rectal bleeding at a cyclical or related to the period. So these are um, quite significant symptoms that require uh, relatively urgent attention. Um, uh, period related or cyclical um, hematuria, so blood and urine and very painful urination at the time of the period or ovulation. A cyclical shoulder tip pain can um, indicate or point towards diaphragmatic endometriosis uh, and uh, those who have had prior uh, open abdominal surgery, uh, such as caesarean sections or um, uh, open procedures for other reasons who have cyclical uh, pain in the scar itself. Um, and the last group would be those who present with uh, delayed fertility or infertility associated with one of the um, above symptoms. Uh, just a few tips uh, in terms of uh, primary care assessment for patients who may potentially have endometriosis. Uh, I always recommend uh, you know, from the first consultation is to provide the patients with a symptom chart or a symptom and pain diary as this really helps in objectifying pain and it also empower patients to demonstrate their uh, symptoms. So they're a bit more aware of that. Um, I do recommend uh, clinicians offer an abdominal and a pelvic examination and there are, there are advantages to it um, as um, it potentially you may be able to feel reduction in the organ mobility uh, and particularly I'm referring to uh, the uterus and also an enlargement in the size of the uterus. Uh, this applies to more severe cases of pelvic adhesions that relate to endometriosis. Also tenderness and nodular feelings or the feelings of nodules um, within the vagina, uh, particularly at the posterior fornix or aspect of the vagina that lies behind the cervix. And also on speculum examinations, you can sometimes see visual or visible vaginal or cervical um, lesions. Um, most patients will undergo some form of imaging, uh, and we'll talk about that 
and uh, further down the track. Uh, but a transvaginal ultrasound is potentially the gold standard. Um, a specialized sort of tertiary level uh, ultrasound um, is recommended. And that, again, depends on where you're, you know, if you're in a smaller town and that the skills of the radiologist or the sonographer uh, are critical uh, in the accuracy of the reporting. Um, and a message that even if your clinical examination is uh, normal and the scan is normal, um, consider referral for further assessment. So, so those who are suspected uh, to have endometriosis or, or have a recent uh, diagnosis of endometriosis where an ultrasound is highly suggestive of dense pelvic adhesions or some nodules, then really uh, moving forward, uh, a referral to a multidisciplinary endometriosis unit or center if it's available in your local district uh, is um, very, very important as it really does affect the outcome of the, 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 the success of uh, the treatment that potentially might be implemented in, in the future. So the, the, the typically a, a multidisciplinary or a tertiary level endometriosis center would involve um, a gynecologist or two with um, expertise in management of endometriosis, um, uh, uh, including level six laparoscopic advanced skills because endometriosis surgery really is harder and more difficult than pelvic cancer surgery is very, very complex. Um, yeah, we, we do also, those units generally have a specialized uh, endometriosis nurse. Um, there is a multidisciplinary pain team. Uh, it also has a pain psychologist and uh, a physiotherapist uh, sort of access to or available on site. Um, and we have one here in Canberra, so that's through our outpatient department. Um, we may not have an on-site psychologist, but we certainly have access to those, including the above, uh, the other health uh, allied health uh, services. Um, so indications to refer women for suspected endometriosis. And the next question is really, sh should you be referring everybody who comes with period pain? And the answer to that is no. Um, my colleague, um, Dr. Uh, Martina Mendes, who's one of our local GPs, is um, currently doing excellent work on setting up uh, GP-led clinic or clinics um, to manage uh, potential patients with endometriosis-related pelvic pain in the community. Uh, there's been some recent funding by the government and she is um, utilizing that very, very well. We just had a couple of meetings recently with her, myself, and um, sort of to outline guidelines and uh, recommendations as to how those clinics are being managed and that that would be very good. So we're looking forward to, to that. Um, but going back to the indications to a fair woman, um, uh, there is, if, if, if um, the imaging, uh, that you have ordered is suggestive of higher stage or deeply infiltrating endometriosis, um, like endometriomas, uh, adenomyosis, or invasion of other organs such bowel and ureter. So if you do a pelvic ultrasound on the tertiary level, the report will come back and they should be able to an extent to allude to potential significant endometriosis. The MRIs are also very good. Um, in identifying lesions in severe endometriosis. Um, also, uh, patients who have persistent severe symptoms, uh, such as severe dysmenorrhea, uh, chronic pelvic pain, or excruciating dys dyspareunia that hasn't responded to a conservative approach. Um, and um, if you encounter any visible lesions on examination, um, and if your initial approach and management hasn't been tolerated, is uh, not effective, or you're unable to um, um, due to contraindications. 
So some facts about the diagnosis of endometriosis uh, that I, I find very useful. Um, we have to agree that normal pelvic and abdominal examinations um, do not exclude endometriosis, uh, but they can be very helpful and they can identify lesions, which um, is what we're really after. Um, they can um, also sort of, as I mentioned pr previously, elicit to reduce uh, organ mobility. Um, another fact is um, that um, the specialized transvaginal ultrasound is the primary investigation of choice um, or screening uh, test of choice. Uh, pelvic MRIs are indicated to assess the extent of the severe deeply infiltrating disease. Um, and I'll touch base on that uh, later on. So then there's a million dollar question <laughs> that you potentially will have different answers to if you ask different people. Uh, well, what do we choose? What's better uh, in diagnosing endometriosis? Uh, should we rely purely on imaging? Should we approach imaging uh, first or should we offer them an laparoscopy? So it, it depends on the extent and the severity of the disease. This is the determining factor that was looked at based on a good body of evidence with several randomized control trials. Um, so what would be useful to recognize is that imaging techniques um, are not good at picking up or diagnosing mild superficial disease, uh, laparoscopy superior. Um, a specialized transvaginal ultrasound and the MRIs are superior to laparoscopy in diagnosing and staging severe and deep infiltrating disease. So uh, if someone <clears throat> on an ultrasound, uh, you have a report that comes back and says, highly suspicious of nodular lesions in the, you know, rectal vaginal septum, the septum that lies between the rectum and the vagina, and, and, and the ovaries have bilateral endometriomas and they're kissing, so there's dense adhesions. Um, you don't have to feel obliged to offer them for a lap or refer them for a laparoscopy. Uh, certainly an MRI would be appreciated um, by a specialist who's about to see them who is an endometriosis specialist. So we know MRIs are very, very useful. They are far more superior than laparoscopies in assessing and staging severe disease. Because when you put a camera inside in severe disease, you've got a curtain of adhesions and a frozen pelvis, and you can see nothing, where the MRI penetrates deep into the tissues. Um, consider laparoscopy, again, if the scan and the MRIs are normal, as I mentioned above that, um, um, and, and that, that, that you know, you've managed them empirically with uh, hormonal treatment or analgesia, and, and, and now there's no improvement, uh, then a laparoscopy for sure is, is uh, an option. Um, and then there's a lot of research at the moment uh, about biomarkers. So, and, you know, they've um, uh, been collecting in studies looking at biomarkers in menstrual blood, uterine fluid, uh, endometrium, or blood serum, uh, biomarkers. So that's all very much, particularly the menstrual blood and uterine fluid and the endometrial biopsies are all very, very early stages of research. So certainly uh, we're not using those. Um, when you look at all the guidelines, they um, do not recommend the use of CA125, which is a blood serum biomarkers. As you all know, it's an, an inflammatory marker. So um, uh, normal CA125 doesn't exclude endometriosis, and elevated CA125 can be found in severe endometriosis, in ovarian endometriomas, in adenomyosis, and that's in relation to endometriosis. And this is based on my experience over a good 15 or 16 years. Sometimes I do use it, um, and certainly I agree with 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 um with it being raised. So a negative CA125 doesn't exclude it, but a positive 
uh, in the absence of any suspicion of malignancy, certainly uh, sh shouldn't be ignored. So my question is, um, is long-term monitoring of women with endometriosis beneficial in preventing adverse outcomes? That's a very common question, and there's a great deal of uncertainty about that in the community. Um, and, and basically, where the, the composite outcome is to look at recurrence rates, complications, and malignancy. Do we, do we do that? Who do we target, and how often do we see them? So certainly, we're on agreement that follow-up and psychological support is to be considered or offered to all women or patients with confirmed endometriosis, uh, particularly the severe cases. Um, currently, there's no evidence for reduction in the composite adverse outcomes that I mentioned above um, in regular long-term surveillance or monitoring um, for the detection, early detection of recurrence complications in malignancy. So um, the appropriate frequency and the type of follow-up uh, should be individualized based on the severity of the disease and the symptoms uh, of a particular patient. So when you encounter or diagnose a 16 or a 15 year old with severe endometriosis, uh, then obviously um, that's very different from someone who you diagnose with endometriosis when you're performing an elective caesarean section for their third child and they're asymptomatic. So they're very different. Uh, now the question is, does early diagnosis of endometriosis versus late diagnosis improve the quality of life of patients? Uh, well, I, I think it does. I think early diagnosis followed by early treatment will uh, certainly reduce pain and um, potentially uh, reduce the risk of future severe disease and 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 certainly um, help with uh, reducing the risk of infertility due to endometriosis. Um, also, diagnosis will provide women and patients and their families with an explanation to the various issues they had and and that can result in a feeling of relief, uh, legitimation and empowerment. And I think that's a very important psychosocial aspect of the care really that sometimes is missed. Um, and it also enables patients to access other support services early. So, you know, the likes of dietitians, psychologists, pain management teams and physiotherapists. So. Uh, and now I will talk about the treatment, uh, endometriosis treatment options. Uh, a question is, um, you know, do you consider a diagnostic laparoscopy for those you suspect who have endometriosis of any kind, mild or moderate or severe, or do you attempt empiric treatment for suspected endometriosis? <clears throat> Both of those options can be considered. Um, there is no evidence of superiority of either approach. Uh, I think in my opinion, um, uh, starting with empirical treatments, uh, sort of hormonal therapy uh, and the like of combined or progestins, the advantage is that it will um, negate the risks of surgery. So complications do occur at the most simplest procedures. Uh, it's just part of operating and how it works, unfortunately. Um, and I want to talk about the medical treatment of endometriosis and adenomyosis related pain. So again, we don't treat things that are asymptomatic and we don't even find out about them. But, um, you know, the available options are various types of analgesia, sort of NSAIDs and so on, uh, the um, neuromodulators and the hormonal treatments. Uh, an empiric initial approach could be uh, an NSAID, sort of a non steroidal anti inflammatory, um, uh, or other um, analgesics alone, or in combination with um, treatments, uh, other treatments, so particularly hormonal treatment to reduce the pain. But the first approach, you can 
you know, I either attempt to NSAID and uh, neurofin and penadol or neurofin and the combined pill. Um, and analgesics, uh, they do provide symptomatic relief. Uh, we all know they don't treat the underlying pathology. Um, uh, I would recommend a short trial of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories with or without paracetamol for cyclical pain and painful periods or dysmenorrhea. I generally try to avoid opioids, obviously, because there's there are other available options. And so the neuromodulators um, have shown promise in the treatment of endometriosis-related pain. Um, you know the antidepressants, the amitriptyline, nortriptyline, the SSRIs, duloxetine, and uh, the anticonvulsants such as gabapentin and pergabalin. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the hormonal medical uh, treatment options available for symptomatic endometriosis as well. Um, it's important for to remind ourselves, uh, as we all know, that uh, the, the condition endometriosis is is predominantly um, estrogen dependent. Um, hence, uh, hormonal therapies that regulate estrogen are a treatment option so they induce what we call a pseudo pregnancy state um also hormonal treatment and manipulation um uh, has been used uh, uh in combination with surgery and i myself do that a lot um preoperatively to optimize our surgical field and postoperatively to sustain symptomatic control and reduce the recurrence of endometriosis um, uh, the hormonal therapies reduce endometriosis related pain by slowing or suppressing the growth of the actual lesions and stopping the bleeding from those lesions. Um, you could offer patients one of the um, uh, the options, hormonal options to um, reduce the endometriosis-related system uh, symptoms. Um, and again, I'll talk about in more details all the hormonal treatments, so particularly the progestins have a similar endpoint result in terms of pain relief. There is none that is superior to the other. They share a common side effect profile. So the decision uh, with, in reference to the choice of the hormonal treatment um, is a, a shared decision between the clinician and the patient himself, depends on the patient's compliance preference, um, individual efficacy of the intervention itself and the cost and the side effects and the availability. And that's very important. So what's available is uh, combined contraceptives, uh, particularly the oral combined contraceptive pill on the vaginal ring. Uh, progestogen, so in an oral form, so the likes of Microlot, Slender, which is a mini pill, uh, Primulet, um, and Dynagest. Uh, there is also the uh, Levonogestrel IUD, referring to specifically the Marina and the Kylina um, implants, also like the Implanon, and then um, the more third line um, treatment, uh, medical treatment options are the GNRH agonist and antagonist, so like uh, the likes of Zolidex and Cineral, which is a nasal spray. Um, the GNRH antagonist is the Allegalex, which is a new oral um, uh, GNRH antagonist option, and the aromatase inhibitors. So where do we start? You know, what do we prescribe again? So uh, just to reinforce the fact that there is no evidence of superiority of one hormonal treatment compared to the others. Hence, the choice of treatment is highly individualized, taking into consideration cost, compliance, prior experience, and side effects, tolerance, and fertility. Um, so I'll start with the oral contraceptive pill and the NuvaRing. Um, just little tips or reminders. 
uh, prescribe it for um, dysmenorrhea, non-menstrual cyclical pain, dyskesia, painful bowel motions at the time of the period, and dyspareunia, sort of deep dyspareunia, deep pain with intercourse. Um, then we, we the question is, again, uh, should we prescribe it in a cyclical fashion, so where the patients do actually um, take sugar pills and have a period, or a continuous where patients attempt to uh, skip menstruation and reduce the frequency of ovulation. Well, the evidence uh, tells us that continuous is more um, effective for dysmenorrhea um, and uh, to try and improve chronic pelvic pain or dyspareunia that really does no, no, no significant difference in whether you prescribe it continuous or cyclical. Um, they both have a similar safety profile. Progestogens, so they come in an oral form, subcuticular and implant, intramuscular injectables and implants. Uh, so the orals, uh, we know are the likes of the northesterone, um, northendron and desigestrol, uh, the um, Provera, um, medroxyprogesterone acetate and the SAN, Depots, um, uh, are the Implanon, the Marina IUD, and the Depo Provera. All of the progestogens have a similar effect on pain reduction, and they have a similar side effect profile. Um, the side effects uh, include irregular cycles, uh, breakthrough bleeding, bloating can be exacerbated in a particular group of patients, so GIT effects, nausea, constipations, headaches, irritability, breast discomfort. And again, um, the multi, a number of factors determine um, the choice of progesterone, but bearing in mind, they all have a similar effect. Um, there are four generations of those, first, second, third, and fourth. All of them bind to multiple receptors, including estrogen, progesterone, androgen, and uh, gonadotropin receptors. They all have the same effect on the endometrium, but they have different effects on other tissues. The GNRH agonists and antagonists, uh, such as Zolodex, Cineral, Zolodex is the implant form, so that's a subcuticular implant that has a slow release for 30 days. Uh, Cineral is the nasal spray that's taken daily. Elagolex is a new well, it's been in the making for a number of years. Um, it's a GNRH antagonist, uh, and it's an oral form. It works exactly the same as Zolodex and Cineral. It very rapidly suppresses ovulation and reduces a pseudo-like um, menopause effect. Um, it's extremely expensive, and I'll touch base on that uh, again later on. And then there's the Lenazolex, which is an IM form. Um, so these are uh, recommended as a second line by a tertiary level center, obviously, under the guidance of a specialist, if uh, hormonal treatment um, was unsuccessful. What's interesting, and based on a number of uh, randomized controlled trials, uh, they the, the all concluded that um, it is actually inferior to the marina and endometriosis pain relief. Um, there is no difference in the effectiveness um, exists whether administrating the uh, agonist or antagonist uh, intramuscular, subcutaneous, or nasal spray. Efficacy is all the same. Uh, the side effects include significant loss of uh, bone mineral density, vaginal dryness, dryness, sorry, low libido, hot flushes. Or, Acne and headaches sort of go align with uh, menopause symptoms, some of those. Um, we prescribe add back therapy to prevent bone loss and uh, hypoestrogenic symptoms. So, uh, low dose combined contraceptive pill is very appropriate and it makes it more tolerable. Uh, where is it used? Um, Preoperative period for severe endometriosis as it reduces the vascularity of the lesions so and the density of adhesions, making surgery to an extent safer and more effective. Um, so we try not to operate in an acute setting where we diagnose severe endometriosis because uh, that is 
very complex and you don't achieve good results. Um, again, the evidence about you know how much the dosage, the duration um, is very limited. Um, uh, so nothing specifically uh, with confidence tells us you know how long can you use a particular agonist or an antagonist for. Um, and then there's the non-pharmacological, non-surgical sort of treatments. Uh, such as behavior on psychological medicine, CBD, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, relaxation techniques, pain management programs, uh, physiotherapy, hypnosis, psychosocial therapy, and biofeedback, um, lifestyle medicine, such as exercise, meditation, and dietary therapies, uh, physical methods, uh, acupuncture, uh, TENS, osteopathy, chiropractic treatments and reflexology and other dietary supplements, uh, herbal medicines and homeopathic therapy. That's um, women often seek these treatments as it enables them to take an active role in their treatment, um, particularly when uh, also others may have exhausted all uh, the other medical and surgical treatment options um, and found them to be ineffective or have intolerable side effects. Uh, so that particular group seeks uh, alternative medicine options. All the alternative therapies uh, could be considered as complementary. Um, I certainly have had patients who benefited from one or the other, um, uh, but there, there should be complementary to pharmacological and surgical treatment options if they were accepted by patients, obviously, but not as a replacement. Um, and that's what they should recognize when they seek our guidance as to, you know, whether or not they should go down that path. I want to talk particularly about the Chinese herbals and the acupuncture. So we generally advise people that there is no evidence to support the use of Chinese herbal medicine. Uh, there are concerns uh, relating to the potential harm of their use. Uh, we do not make recommendations for one specific non-medical intervention. Um, as the potential benefits and harms are unclear. Um, and we also relay the limited evidence in the, um, on the effectiveness of acupuncture for the management of endometriosis pain. Um, I want to talk about uh, fertility or and endometriosis or infertility and endometriosis. So management strategies when we're faced with uh, this issue, um, it's best to involve an interdisciplinary team, which includes a specialist with a specific interest in fertility associated with endometriosis. So in an ideal world, you would find a subspecialist or a specialist gynecologist who deals with this. Um, so that these are common questions that, or scenarios that the general practitioners can encounter, which, uh, you know, patients will come and and say, um, I've had a recent laparoscopy at a public hospital. I wasn't followed up and I was diagnosed with um, endometriosis. Um, and I have been trying for three years. I'm not pregnant. Um, and I've read online that I, if I go on, on the pill for 12 months or 24 months, and she's, you know, 37 years of age or 35, then it's better for me. I may well get pregnant. So don't, don't do that. There's no evidence again, um, to support recommending, uh, hormonal treatment, uh, with those or hormonal suppression with those who are trying to conceive, um, spontaneously. So if they want to, and then they have to try naturally without any intervention. Um, discuss the option of a laparoscopy uh, procedure or surgery as a treatment option uh, and do not offer post-operative hormonal suppression for those seeking immediate pregnancy uh, with the sole, sole purpose to enhance future pregnancy rates. So we know that doesn't work. Um, and, and my approach based on this evidence is uh, we tell patients the first 12 to 24 months are 
in, uh, immediately following surgery for endometriosis are the as as the is the best time where you have the highest chance of falling pregnant spontaneously. Um, what are the treatment options for so someone who has endometriosis and uh, related infertility? Um, there are four. Um, no intervention. Uh, so expectant management. Again, I'll go through this, but th these options are very individualized. So the you know selection criteria are very specific. Every each patient is very very different to its peer. So you know the age matters a great deal. Other um, risk factors for infertility or other medical conditions that may be contributing to delay infertility. Um, the partner's uh, position, in particular the semen analysis and so on, it all makes a huge difference. So um, an example of the trial of an expecting manager will be appropriate for someone who uh, had a laparoscopy for painful periods at the age of 24 or 25 and has um, just started, you know, trying for pregnancy for six or eight months or 10 months. And obviously it's appropriate for her to go down that path. Uh, surgical removal of endometriosis followed by expectant management is another option. So that's for those, again, similar scenario uh, where the maternal fertility age is still below 35. Um, that's appropriate. Uh, third option would be surgical removal of endometriosis followed by assisted reproductive technique. So um, that option applies to those that, you know, are 35 age, years of age and older. Um, those who have uh, uh, blocked fallopian tubes, um, severe endometriosis, and then go straight to ART, assisted reproductive techniques. Uh, and there's a very particular group, uh, which is those who have multiple organ involvement, uh, blocked fallopian tubes. Um, uh, the evidence is they actually go to uh, proceed with ART rather than surgery if they can afford that or if it's available. If it's not available, then surgery. Um, is surgery effective to increase the chances of natural pregnancy uh, for those who have infertility um, uh, due to endometriosis. Uh, so um, peritoneal endometriosis, so that's superficial or mild endometriosis where there are no, uh, there's no distortion of the pelvic anatomy, the, there's no pelvic adhesions, there's no other organs that are involved. Then um, uh, the evidence supports um, an improvement or an increase in the uh, percentage of the uh, of, uh, uh, of those who do become pregnant following surgery. Um, ovarian endometriomas, uh, yes, for large primary endometriomas, um, fertility outcomes are better. Um, it increases their chances of spontaneous uh, or natural pregnancy. However, um, recurrent endometriosis, repeat surgery on those is not supported uh, because that repetitive trauma to the ovaries actually reduces the ovarian reserve. Um, and that uh, impairs both expectant or natural pregnancy chances and also has a profound negative impact on uh, IVF and so on. So, the general approach is to remove endometriomas that are more than 30 mils or more than three centimeters in diameters. And I'm referring to asymptomatic um, endometriomas that with in a, 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 a an infertility patient. Now, symptomatic endometriomas are different. You tackle them or you remove them regardless of their size. But uh, just please remember, we're talking about infertility. Uh, so if they're more than three centimeters or 30 mils in volume, um, remove them because it, it um, 
A, reduces symptoms, and B, facilitates access to the ovaries by the IVF specialist. So, I mean, I've dealt with a, a reasonable number of post-egg retrieval, very severe sepsis and pelvic infections and tubo ovarian abscesses from those who had IVF cycles with in large endometriomas. And it's not, it's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing to have to deal with. Um, also, there's good evidence to support um, an increased chance of natural pregnancy um, when, sur when, when uh, uh, surgery is undertaken uh, for deep endometriosis. Um, the evidence is, is all looked at randomizing um, uh, bowel involvement and central disease. So it's, it's not very clear, but in our experience, yes, it does. Um, so I want to talk about the decision to offer surgery for endometriosis related infertility should be guided by the following factors, uh, the patient's age and the patient's preference, because these options kind of um, cross over. So there's no absolute contraindication or lack of recommendation. The patients, if they're symptomatic or not, uh, history of prior surgery, particularly um, in recurrent endometriomas, uh, have to factor in the ovarian reserve. So, you know, if you have someone who have a primary endometrioma of three centimeters, but the AMH is very, very low, then you really have to think about that uh, before you embark on removing the, the cyst. Um, and uh, the presence of other infertility causes, the severity of the disease and complications impact on future fertility. So all of those should be considered when we're talking about surgery. Is assisted reproductive, are assisted reproductive techniques effective for infertility associated with endometriosis? Um, yes, in short. So in infertile women with mild disease or mild endometriosis, which is classified as stage one and two, that's the depth of infiltration of the lesion inside in the peritoneum. Um, so in, in, in stage one and two, uh, clinicians may perform intratrine insemination with ovarian stimulation. Instead of expectant management, it increases pregnancy outcomes. Although the value of IUI in infertile women with severe endometriosis with tubal potency is uncertain, it still can be considered. Um, it is not wrong. Women can be reassured that ovarian stimulation doesn't increase the recurrent risk of endometriosis. So if the woman comes to her GP and said, I've seen an IVF specialist um, going to go through a cycle, I do have severe endometriosis. I'm really worried that it's going to get 10 times worse. Well, the evidence doesn't support that. So now, you know, that depends on the quality of the evidence. Um but overall, there's a consensus that it 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 doesn't. What non-medical management strategies are available for endometriosis related infertility? Well, unfortunately, none. So there's no clear evidence that any non-medical interventions uh, will be of benefit to increase the chance of pregnancy. Um, we can't really make any recommendations in support of. Um, nutrition, Chinese herbal medicine, electrotherapy, or acupuncture, um, because we don't know the potential benefits and harms. It's unclear. No studies have been sort of undertaken looking at that that are credible. Um, the impact of pregnancy on endometriosis is interesting. It's not uncommon for women with endometriosis to be advised that becoming pregnant is may might be a useful strategy to manage their pain specifically uh, and reduce the disease progression. Um, and that's the principle behind that is uh, that the, the hormonal treatment creates a pseudo pregnancy uh, phase where um, this uh, has a positive effect on symptoms. However, the behavior of the 
endometriosis lesions in pregnancy seems to be inconsistent and it's quite variable. So um, it could range from complete disappearance to an increase in growth through a process called decid decidualization uh, and vascularization. So the lesion necrosis is also possible and that can cause severe pain and bleeding internally. So spontaneous hemoperitoneum, which we have had two cases of the last 10 years at the Canberra Hospital, life-threatening cases. The impact of pregnancy on endometriosis, well, uh, patients shouldn't be advised to become pregnant for the sole purpose of treating endometriosis, obviously, as pregnancy doesn't always lead to an improvement in the symptoms or a reduction in the disease progression. Endometriomas may change in pregnancy, so uh, decidualization uh, or the neovascularization can resemble malignant tissue. So we must not um, ignore them. Um, if an atypical endometrioma is found in an ultrasound in the community, then a referral to a tertiary level unit uh, is important. Uh, again, if there's change in the um, characteristics of the system pregnancy, because they can undergo a malignant uh, transformation into epithelial cell cancer. What are the possible complications during pregnancy from pre-existing endometriosis lesions? So, you know, we have patients with chronic pelvic pain who come with acute pain flare-ups while they're pregnant. It's important to recognize and remember the process of vascularization, lesion vascularization. So endometriomas can be infected, enlarge, uh, can rupture, the ovary can tort. Um, uh, gastrointestinal uh, symptoms, so spontaneous intestinal perforation. Um, that's when you have a, a nodule in a part of the small bowel or the large bowel that had uh, full thickness penetration and, and it, it, it vascularizes and, and it can lead to a bowel birth. We've had one case in about 15 years here at Canberra Hospital. Um, it's very rare and it generally occurs in the third trimester. They come in with non specific acute pain, nausea, and vomiting, and then they become septic. Um, spontaneous uterine rupture that's the three case reports in the literature, uh, mainly on the posterior uterine wall in the lower segment. Um, all of those have had prior endometriosis surgery. And again, the question is, you know, have they had adenomyosis removed or not? Um, because that weakens the uterine uh, muscular layer. Um, but certainly full thickness lesions in the uterus, particularly around the scar of a prior Caesar, are very aggressive and can penetrate and dehease the wound quite easily. Uh, vascular complications, a spontaneous hemoperitoneum in pregnancy, uh, ship syndrome. So, and uh, again, it's uh, pelvic implants, uh, depending on their location, can bleed or they can actually rupture a blood vessel. And we had a very interesting near-death case most recently uh, of a third trimester pregnancy who presented to Canberra Hospital with um, in a hypovolemic shock and he was hemodynamically unstable. And we obviously operated on her immediately and had about three and a half liters of hemoperitoneum, um, severe adhesions from endometriosis, and we couldn't identify any other source of bleeding. So, so uh, a diagnosis by excluding was ship. Um, what is the impact of endometriosis on early pregnancy? Um, there may be an increased risk of first trimester miscarriages and ectopic pregnancy, particularly in women with severe endometriosis with a lot of adhesions who, that may have damaged the fallopian tubes. The recurrence of endometriosis varies widely, so that's ranging from 0 to 90%. The risk factors include patient-related factors like the patient's age. Obviously, the younger they are, the more likely they'll have recurrence. Family history also plays an important role and surgery associated variables. So it depends on the severity of the condition, radicality of the surgery, the surgical technique, all of that matters. Um, 
recurrence prevention strategies, um, little tips when we operate on the endometriomas that are more than three centimeters, we try or perform a cystectomy rather than drain and, and coagulate. Uh, much smaller uh, cysts um, are dealt by drainage because removing them really damage a lot of ovarian tissue. Um, consider an IUD marina or a combined oral contraceptive postoperatively for at least 18 to 24 months for prevention of endometriosis associated, associated uh, dysmenorrhea. A lot of studies looked at that. And I tell patients, um, if your primary symptom coming to see me is severe period pain, um, and you subsequently are diagnosed surgically with severe endometriosis, even by treating that um, is not going to substantially improve dysmenorrhea. And the reason behind that is the um, adenomyosis that's there too. So certainly, in my experience, um, post-operative hormonal therapy has been quite beneficial. Um, after surgical management of ovarian endometriomas, I recommend long-term hormonal treatments, so continuous uh, pill for secondary prevention of recurrent endometrioma and also to improve the symptoms. Uh, and long-term post-op hormonal treatment should be considered in severe deep endometriosis. So the key message is post-operative hormonal su suppression is beneficial. I want to talk a little about adolescent endometriosis. So the risk factors to that include family history, um, genital malformations leading to obstructive menstrual flow, uh, early age menarche, uh, short cycles, and severe dysmenorrhea and cyclical absenteeism from school. Um, the clinical symptoms are not greatly different. So um, we should remind ourselves to Take an airful history, careful, sorry, not airful, careful, and consider the following symptoms. So dysmenorrhea, dysuria, dyskesia, dyspareunia, are pretty much similar, cyclical pelvic pain, and absence from school. Um, we have to be mindful that um, uh, in adolescents with suspected endo where imaging is negative, medical treatments are not useful, offer a diagnostic laparoscopy. So I'm very... Um, Big on that, uh, and we do diagnose some significant endometriosis at you know from the age of fifteen onwards. Uh, is the treatment different for the adolescent endometriosis? Uh, no, it isn't. So first line will be hormonal contraception or progestogens. Uh, second line is non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. That's the only difference. So uh, hormonal is first. And the third line is, you know, the complex GRNH agonists and with that back therapy and so on. The surgical treatment in adolescent endometriosis um, can be considered. However, the symptoms, symptom recurrence rate obviously may be considerable, especially when surgery is not followed by hormonal treatment. So that's a big difference with adults. A hormonal treatment for the teenagers is crucial to try and minimize recurrence and recurrence of symptoms. Um, obviously, laparoscopically, when feasible, uh, by an experienced uh, surgeon, um, removal of all lesions is critical rather than burning them, and uh, post-operative hormonal suppression again. Um, endometriosis in post-menopausal women, so again, we should be mindful that um, endometriosis could still be active and symptomatic in postmenopausal women. The recurrence is more prevalent in postmenopausal HRT users, especially uh, a group who've had a hysterectomy and are on estrogen only therapy. So uh, that's important when you prescribing HRT, obviously in hysterectomies to ask if they've had, you know, endometriosis, did they have it because of that? Has it been surgically proven? Um, because it also increases, you know, there's a risk that those lesions can actually go um, through malignant transformation. And well, how how could it be active in postmenopause? Well, the, the, the theory is um, complex. It's 
potentially possible because some of those lesions have local aromatase expression. So they make their local own estrogen and sometimes extra ovarian estrogen, you know, production from skin fat tissue uh, can keep them active. I've certainly seen two or three cases in postmenopausal women. Um, treatment to surgery, you've got to diagnose it so you don't miss and you exclude malignancy. Uh, particularly I'm referring to ovarian cysts, you know, and um, the aromatase inhibitors is um, maybe considered particularly if surgery is an option and that's that's sort of a fourth treatment option. It's a bit more detailed, more complex. So, um, that's a, I just touched base on the potential malignant transformation and the microscopic implants of endometriosis in the um, postmenopausal women and um, you know for menopause related symptoms for those who had a past history of severe endometriosis tibolon could also be an alternative to HRT and that is it thanks very much everyone